Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Mary Oliver first asked that poem in her, asked that question in her 1992 poem, The Summer Day. And I'm here today to propose that there could be no more important question to ask in the lives of healthcare workers. My name is Vanessa Downing. I'm a psychologist, but I'm also a healthcare worker well being expert. I've worked for 15 years in large healthcare systems, first in a VA methadone clinic, then as a member of the heart failure team and for the last nearly decade have worked trying to improve healthcare systems that healthcare workers live in. So since we first started with Mary Oliver's powerful question, let's keep things going and we're gonna to play together a game called Never Have I Ever. So what I'd like you to do is think about your life as a healthcare worker. And I want you to recall all of the times that you worked through shifts taking care of patients focused on your team and your organization and their needs. And I'd like you to put your hand up if any of this resonates with you. So, hands up anybody in the audience who has never peed right when you had to. Anybody who was taking care of a patient and became an expert at holding it. Okay, next question. Has anybody here missed a meal? Hands up, I, yeah, I see them going up in the crowd. If you haven't eaten because someone else needed you. Okay, final question. Have you ever missed a family event? And I'm talking about like a date with a spouse or maybe something more important like a, a funeral or a wedding. Okay, so no more hands in the air, but I just want you to take a moment to reflect on this more comprehensive list that I found that is about a very special group of workers. Take a look through this list and tell me if any of these things, just think to yourself, do any of these resonate with you? Any of them from feeling like you have family members who are wondering why you chose your field of work or maybe wishing that you would consider something else? Not having enough resources to get the work done. Maybe sometimes feeling like you hold yourself to too high a standard. Anybody on teams that are experiencing a lot of conflict? So if any of this resonates with you when you think about your work as a healthcare worker, I have to admit to you that this is not actually a list about healthcare worker well-being, but this is from a website called SuperheroNation.com, and it's actually an article about the common obstacles that superheroes face besides supervillains. And I'll put up the citation there in case anybody wants to look it up themselves. Uh, I came across this list because I have twin boys who love all things Marvel. And they wanted me to do a little bit of research for them. And when I did, I found this list and was really struck by how much I related to it and how much it seemed to describe for me what the lives of the healthcare workers that I know and love looks like. More recently, we have fallen in love with this new Marvel show called What If? And it imagines alternative outcomes for superheroes. One night, I was sitting at the dinner table with one of my sons, and he asked me about an episode that would involve Tony Stark, also known as Iron Man. He asked, what if Tony Stark had never gotten attacked in the desert? What if he had never had his heart damaged? Would he still become a superhero? And it really struck me that, that even my little boy knew this American story, that pain is needed to germinate heroism. And that stuck with me as I saw all of the pain and the trauma that my colleagues experienced during COVID. Of course, I wasn't the only one who was making connections between healthcare workers and superheroes. In the early days of the pandemic, as COVID surged across the UK, May 2020, overnight in the emergency department of Southampton General, the elusive and mysterious artist Banksy unveiled Game Changer. I have to admit to you, when I first saw it, I cried. 
It took me right back to my days working on the, the heart failure unit when I walked around trying to get to know the nurses and the cardiologists that I was going to spend my days with. And I asked them, what are your lives like? What's it like to work here? And I'll never forget asking those questions because the answers they gave me were so direct, so honest. Some of them had tears in their eyes and they told me, you know, nobody's ever asked me that before. And so in those early days of COVID, I was just grateful to see healthcare workers getting the gratitude and the appreciation that I felt that they deserved. But as COVID wore on and I got pulled into break rooms and hallways and support group sessions and had private conversations with the healthcare workers that I knew and they shared with me how exhausted they were, how just to the bone weary they felt, how isolated, how angry. This superhero comparison started to get under my skin and I couldn't figure out why it were at first. So like any good academic, I went to the literature, only instead of going to the psychology literature, I researched stories and hero stories in particular. I came across something called the American monomyth storyline, and it goes a little something like this. A paradise community is suddenly imperiled by evil. Normal institutions fail to topple the threat until a superhero emerges, casts aside all temptations to vanquish the threat, and then recedes back into obscurity and the community returns to a paradise. <laughs> so why is this story a problem when we apply it to healthcare workers? Well, in my view, this superhero comparison obscures the very messy, but much more interesting and impressive three-dimensionality of healthcare workers. As a matter of fact, the more I thought about these comparisons between superheroes and healthcare workers, the starker the difference seemed to me. I mean, when superheroes act fearlessly alone, healthcare workers actually feel true courage, which means feeling fear and acting anyway. When superheroes charge in, well, what are we normal people supposed to do? We're supposed to just hang back and let them take over. But in this pandemic, we know that what helps healthcare workers more than anything else is us doing a good job of taking care of each other, wearing our masks, social distancing, getting vaccinated, washing our hands. And when you think about superheroes, what matters most? Their primary identity of being a superhero. But the healthcare workers I know, they have so many identities that are equally important. They're parents, they're children of adult parents, they're artists, musicians, athletes. Humanity, breakable, vulnerable humanity. It can really feel like a liability in times of crisis. I mean, think back to those questions at the beginning about stopping to pee and eat. Those things take a lot of time. So it makes sense that healthcare workers would start to skimp here and there, and that they might start to think that their super superpower is pushing through, enduring anything, running towards the things that other people run away from. But here's the thing that I know for sure about everybody in this room. If on your way to your car tonight, you slipped and you fell and you thought you broke your arm, you would know exactly what to do. You would get super curious about what had happened to your arm. You would get an x-ray. You'd ask for expert help. You'd maybe get physical therapy. You would recover. But when it comes to trauma and burnout, it can feel like the worst thing to do is start asking questions. So what are we supposed to do when it feels like the best thing to do is avoid how we're feeling and stay away? 
The world is full of evil and lies and pain and death. You can't run from it, you can only face it. The question is, when you do, how do you respond? Who do you become? Questions like this get asked a lot in superhero movies. And how do superheroes tend to answer? Well, they do. They jump into action. And guess who else does? Healthcare workers. Healthcare workers want an A, and they get great at what they practice. They launch into action, and they do far past the point of most normal people's endurance. Wash, rinse, repeat. Well, history repeats too. And I want to take a moment to look back into history with you to see what science has to tell us about avoiding asking questions and trying to go it alone. This is a picture from 1939 from something called Operation Pied Piper. And it was this gut-wrenching but totally well-intended effort to get children out of harm's way during World War II. In about a week, 3.5 million children were separated from their parents, taken out of cities like London that were target-rich environments for bombs, and taken off to the countryside where presumably they'd be safer. A few years later, these children started to be returned to their homes, and researchers began to investigate their experiences. And the results were grim. As early as 1941, researchers like Anna Freud found that the children who had been taken away to safety, separated from their parents, had higher rates of trauma than the children who had been allowed to stay with their families through the bombing. And it turns out the impact of this separation from primary support systems had ripples that endured for generations. More recent research has looked at the outcomes for the grandchildren of these who were separated in childhood and found that those grandchildren had higher rates of psychiatric hospitalization than the children who were allowed to stay. Studies like this are so important because they suggest to us that safety is not about being whisked away somewhere else. Safety is with each other. In times of crisis, the wise build bridges, while the foolish build barriers. So if we accept this basic premise that connection to each other is the ultimate armor to help us get through trauma, who are we supposed to build those bridges to? I mean, you think about the pandemic, look left, look right. Who in this room hasn't been impacted? Who are we supposed to lean on? So 30 years ago, sociologist Ray Oldenburg came up with the term the third place. The third place are these very special spots of community engagement that exist between home and work. We know that home and work give us incredible meaning, love, and support, but they are also places of tremendous responsibility. Third places, on the other hand, you can come and go. There's no responsibility for you to be there. You're not in charge of keeping it financially afloat. They're like coffee shops and libraries, public parks, music halls, like this. Third places are special because they're places where you can start to figure out, who am I? What part of me shows up at home and work and in that third place? Who am I when I'm off the clock? If you think about it, even Superman had his third place, right? His fortress. This was not his home, it was not his work, but his fortress of solitude was a third place where only his most trusted confidants were allowed in. For most of us in this room, before the pandemic, those third places were enough. They were places where we could become regulars, engage in meaningful relationships, build friendships, and eventually trust each other, rely on each other. But those third places are one of the many things that the pandemic has taken from us. And so if you are someone 
who can relate to this idea of believing that your ability to endure anything has been your superpower, I'm here to propose that it might actually be your kryptonite. Something I want to tell you about me. I have spent a lot of the last two years supporting and hearing the stories of healthcare workers on the front lines who have been taking care of COVID patients. I didn't do what they did. I didn't see what they saw, but I needed help coping with it. You deserve that too. Psychologists, coaches, therapists, chaplains, you deserve to be with somebody whose sole mission is to attend to you after so many relentless days of having all of your attention trained on the needs of others. I can tell you one thing for sure. I am not the same person that I was before this pandemic happened, and I bet you're not either. So in the spirit of you finding your relational third place, I'll ask you again, tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Thank you.